In one of the previous videos I recorded, we already talked about how the postsynaptic neuron can be affected by both excitatory connections and also inhibitory connections. So the synapses that are actually attached to it or the neurons that are attached to it coming before can actually tell it to fire or not fire. And it's the sum of all these responses. So I used an image that looked like this, that basically if you have a whole bunch of signals, some are saying do it, some are saying don't do it. In the end, whether you fire or not, or whether you take that action or not, depends on the summation of all these signals. Are there more telling you to do it or more telling you to not do it? So that was explained in a previous video. So here are some details about the difference between excitation and inhibition. So this statement here in the center is a good one to start with. So a postsynaptic neuron, in other words, a neuron that's at the end, or this is the beginning of a postsynaptic neuron. Here's the presynaptic neuron. So a postsynaptic neuron can have many excitatory or inhibitory presynaptic neurons. And whether the impulse is stimulated or not, whether this continues to send off a signal depends on the summation or the total sum of all the neurotransmitters received. So this neuron down here can actually be connected to multiple, multiple, multiple other neurons. And so whether this thing fires or not depends on the summation. So that was summarized in a previous video. So this table kind of summarizes a couple ways that you can excite or you can inhibit a particular neuron. So if the ion that goes in is positively charged, then you can end up causing the membrane potential to rise higher, or if it's they're negatively charged ions, you can cause the membrane potential to drop. And that's going to have either an excitatory or an inhibitory effect. So you either excite an impulse as the threshold potential is reached, or you end up inhibiting because you are not allowing that depolarization to actually happen. As a side note, there's also something called slow acting neurotransmitters, a very uh, small and specific detail they've added into the syllabus. So you've already learned about regular neurotransmitters. This is a mess down here, I'm sorry. But you normally have neurotransmitters that have to diffuse across this membrane. These are the regular neurotransmitters that you've learned about. So one extra thing that might be interesting for you to understand is that there are certain types of neurotransmitters that are considered slow acting. So you must distinguish between regular transmitters and then these slow acting ones. So what's special about these slow acting ones is that they don't just affect one neuron, they can actually diffuse around the surrounding fluid and affect groups of neurons. So affecting a lot of them, not just one. And this can last for a while basically, and they can cause secondary messengers to actually be um, secreted. And one interesting thing is that they can modulate fast transmission for days. So the presence of these slow acting neurotransmitters can play a role in memory and learning. And a fancy way that we talk about that is synaptic plasticity. Earlier in this unit, when we talked about neurulation and the formation of neurons, we talked about how the brain is plastic, but not in terms of like the stuff that it's made of that would suck if your brain was actually plastic. That's a cute little eye right there. But plastic meaning it can be changed. We talk about plasticity. It can be changed over time based on experiences that you have.